we're good to go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Convict Leasing and Labor's um, Project History Exposed webinar series. My name is Jasmine Smith. I'm a junior undergrad at Rice University studying psychology, and I'm also a TCJC intern. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, and my name is Olivia Ogumake. I am also a TCJC intern, as well as a Rice Jones, Rice actually, a Rice undergrad, got my um, degree in psychology and also a Rice Business School current student candidate. Um, and for those who are new to the series, the Convict, Le the Convict Labor Leasing Project is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to expose the history of the convict leasing system and its connection to modern prison slavery while restoring the dignity of all victims of forced labor and their descendants. The Convict Leasing and Labor Project was founded by the late Reginald Moore who championed nearly three decades of activism on the issue of convict leasing. He was dedicated to uncovering and commemorating the history of convict leasing and other abuses in the Texas prison system and predicted the site of the Sugarland 95 um, well before their discovery in 2018. Our work includes this webinar series titled History Exposed. This series brings together academics, community members, students, and activists to reveal the history of oppression within the criminal justice system in Texas and beyond. Through this, through this series, we seek to shine light on the Sugarland 95, make the history of convict leasing public knowledge and eliminate deep faults in the current legal system. History Exposed is in partnership with the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition, also known as TCJC. The previous two episodes are available on our YouTube channel, so make sure to check them out as well. So in 2018, 95 remains of African-American convict leasing laborers were unearthed during the construction of Fort Bend Independent School District's James Reese Technical and Career Center in Sugarland, Texas. For many, the story of the Sugarland 95 has been put to rest. However, for others, this chapter will never fully close or heal. Did the newly published report answer all of the questions that the discovery brought forth? Why is the name, quote, Bullhead Camp Cemetery, end quote, being challenged? Today, we will consider these questions by sharing with you a culmination of rigorous research by our team members. We like to recognize the members who contributed before introducing our main speakers. Gabrielle and Elaine trace the ownership of the, um, of the plot of land, sorry, on which the Sugar Land 95 were found. By combining those through land deeds, public records and news articles to determine the location of the original Bullhead Camp Cemetery. cemetery. Ingrid um, studied archival maps, which solidified our suspicions about the locations of Bullhead Camp Cemetery. Lastly, thank you to all of our interns. Your work has been invaluable in helping us pursue the truth. Our guests today are Serena Barbieri and Dr. Zachary Montz. Ms. Barbieri is an editorial assistant at the Journal of Southern History and second year PhD student at Rice University. She created a database of Texas's convicts leased out to Sugarland plantations for TCJC. Dr. Zachary Montz is a lecturer in the Department of History at Sam Houston State University. Dr. Montz also serves as a Harris County Project Fellow where he provides historical consulting and support for TCJC and is currently working on issues related to convict leasing and the Sugarland Sugar 95. Now I will pass it off to Dr. Montz. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. I wanna thank Olivia and uh, Jasmine uh, for their introduction and for hosting today. And I also want to thank the Convict Leasing and Labor Project for putting on today's event beyond the Sugarland 95. Um, my name is Zach Motz. I'm a lecturer in the Department of History at Sam Houston State University. And from time to time, I am a historical researcher with the uh, CLLP. Uh, for the past several months, I've been working with the CLLP staff and student researchers on a project to document the history of convict leasing in Texas. What spurred this project, of course, was the discovery in 2018 of 95 sets of remains at a construction site for Fort Bend ISD. 
That was land that had been for much of the 20th century, the central or imperial prison farm. And before that, the Sartarsha plantation owned by two generations of the Ellis family. As stated in the introduction, uh, even before the bodies of the 95 convict laborers had been unearthed, uh, Mr. Reginald Moore, the CLLP founder and local activist, had been a persistent and often lonely voice in insisting that that site uh, be given a thorough archaeological survey before construction began. His suspicion, of course, that there were convict laborers buried there, of course, uh, was uh, true. Remains appeared during construction, and Fort Bend ISD hired a professional environmental and archaeological consultants to complete a comprehensive survey of the site and the remains that were found there. The result of that survey of course, is the report that has just been released in August 2020, a couple months ago, uh, by Fort Bend ISD. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that report uh, today and also about some of our own research. Um, the report itself is quite remarkable and uh, quite comprehensive. It's physically massive and also represents an incredible undertaking by the people who were involved in it. Um, Serena and I are going to talk a little bit about that report uh, and also about some of our own research that suggests a few corrections and I think most importantly some avenues uh, for future research, collaboration, and some thoughts on public education where we might go from here. Uh, I want to kind of stress again that the Fort Bend report really is an impressive document of the SL95 site. It includes a comprehensive account of the site's ownership, a task that I know uh, involved combing through lots of old property records, hundreds of pages of details about the remains found there, something that's going to be essential in the future to the task of identifying those remains. The archaeological work in particular, I think, is very interesting for uh, historians uh, to look through and kind of learn about a, a new way of understanding the past. It also contains, of course, a list of 70 to, uh, 72 names of convicts that died on labor camps uh, in the immediate area of the Sugarland 95 site. Uh, the report really is a great and huge first step in the larger project of building public understanding of convict lease. Now, our research at CLLP has focused on how we might further that understanding by going beyond the Sugarland 95. And in our short time today, I just want to talk about two elements of that. The first is our efforts to create a comprehensive and publicly available database of all convict leases in the state of Texas. And the second is our research into the proper name of the Sugarland 95 site. This is an issue that is really essential to the way that we tell the history of convict lease and the history of uh, Sugarland. And I think represents an uh, important, in this case, correction to the work of the report. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about our broader efforts, and I want to uh, share my screen here. So pardon me while I just bring this up very quickly. Oops. Let's see if we can't get screen sharing enabled that says host disabled. Um, while we get that set up, uh, let me just kind of talk about uh, what we did. Uh, working with some of the CLLP researchers, uh, we've gone through the records of the Texas prison system, and we have built a database of all of the convict leases uh, here in Texas. I'm going to quick uh, share, do a screen share so we can kind of see what is going on there. Okay, so we combed through a bunch of uh, old reports of the uh, prison system. I just have the front piece of one of them uh, here. And going through those, uh, we pulled out kind of all data related to uh, the convict leases. You can kind of just see a screenshot here of the, one of these databases. Um, from the 1880s until around 1910, thousands of men per year, and in some cases women as well, were leased by the state. If you've attended any of the other webinars that CLLP has put on, you've heard excellent histories of this. These convict laborers, many of them convicted for very minor crimes, were put to work in often brutal conditions that looked a whole lot like the system of slavery that convicts leased 
uh, replaced. These people labored on uh, railroads, they labored in mines, but they mostly labored on plantations, the majority of which uh, were along the Brazos River here. You can see in our uh, in the screenshot here, kind of we have the list of the names of the people leasing convicts, the, uh, the year or range of the lease, the number of convicts, the county that it's in. Our database uh, provides uh, details on the sites of labor, as you see here, as well as data on uh, escapees, uh, deaths, and where available data on the race of laborers and economic details of the lease, how much people were paying the state. Uh, etc. This is just another screen uh, cap that I did. And you can see here, this is a record of escapes, uh, recaptures, and deaths. Uh, and it's broken down by where our uh, convict laborers uh, were working over here on the right. These databases are quite large. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, entries for them. Now, we aim to make these available on the internet through CLLP in the next few months. And this, we hope, will enable uh, scholars and educators and students and the general public, anybody who kind of hears about the story of the Sugar Land 95, to click through and begin to explore this history and ask the sorts of questions that we're probably not even uh, thinking about to kind of produce a broader kind of public and scholarly discussion on uh, questions of convict lease. So we're hoping that this uh, will be fruitful uh, towards that effort. Now, in our research, we have paid special attention to uh, the two largest leases in Fort Bend County during the period of convict lease. And those were leases associated with the Ellis and the Cunningham plantations uh, just outside of uh, Sugarland. Uh, both of them now kind of substantially developed with suburban houses. And in the case of the Cunningham lease, a lot of the commercial areas of Sugarland. Um, Ellis and Cunningham may be familiar names to a lot of people. They helped establish the convict lease system in Texas. They're well known as important founders of Sugarland. Now, the Sugarland 95 site that is the subject of the report, uh, I kind of just uh, put a little blue circle around it here on the map. It is on the Ellis land, or what was known as the Sartarsha plantation. The Cunningham plantation is just uh, to the right of this image, just to the east centered on what today is the first colony area of uh, Sugarland. This map, by the way, uh, uh, the product of uh, work by uh, one of our CLLP researchers, Ingrid, who kind of had to dig around in an archive in uh, Galveston, I believe, uh, to come up with it. Um, you can see some of the kind of cool work that's contributing to this. Um, our research onto these uh, plantations leads us really to the second issue that I want to talk about, and that is the proper name of the Sugarland 95 site. Um, just kind of as a headline, in short, we believe that the name that's given to the site by Fort Bend ISD, that is Bullhead Camp Cemetery, is incorrect, and that we uh, think that the cemetery more properly should be called the Ellis Camp Cemetery. What you see here is just a picture of the site as it presently exists. I think this was taken a month or so ago. You can see these wooden stakes in the ground to mark uh, graves. That is the technical center in the background. And there in the front is the, uh, the kind of sign. You can see the, the piece has kind of come down and is propped up against it for now. But the sign identifying it as a Bullhead Camp cemetery. I want to talk about kind of that name, where it came from, and, and why we think it should be more properly called Ellis Camp. Let's just start very quickly by looking at where this uh, name comes from. The Fort Bend ISD report derives the name from a single mention in testimony that was given by a camp guard by the name of Ritchie uh, during a 1909 state senate investigation into conditions at the convict lease camps. The state conducted investigations in the 1890s and in the first decade of the 20th century uh, in response to reports of outrages at these camps. And the record of those investigates, uh, investigations kind of gives us probably our best descriptions of the, what the camps looked like and their location and how they operated. There are two things I wanna quickly point out here. Uh, the first is this uh, sentence that Richie gives us, which where he says that generally, you have on each camp what is known as a convict uh, graveyard. This claim that all the camps had cemeteries 
just kind of furthers our belief that the story of the Sugarland 95 site really is just the tip of the iceberg and that a proper telling of the convict lease story will require us to think about all the sites that have not been uh, discovered. The second part of this that really grabs the eye, of course, is his description of a Bullhead Camp cemetery. And you can see how mention of a cemetery being at a place called Bullhead Camp led to the conclusion that the Sugarland 95 site, the only convict lease cemetery that's been uncovered in the area, was Bullhead Camp. But we don't think that the, uh, the Sugarland 95 site is the site being described here by uh, Mr. Ritchie, the camp guard. Uh, there's a couple of things that lead us to this conclusion. The first is that a few pages earlier in this testimony, if you scroll back through it, that same guard, Richie, testifies that he worked on the Cunningham Plantation and not on the Ellis Land where the Sugarland 95 site is found. Elsewhere in the same report, as you see in this image at the bottom, testimony taken from a different guard at the Cunningham camp made clear that Bullhead was a name given not to an Ellis camp, but to Cunningham camp number two. And this is the probably the clearest link that is made there. Going back and looking through newspapers at the time, we find some other uh, evidence. On the left here is just a short uh, grab from an Austin American Statesman article at the time, or actually probably uh, just called the Austin Statesman at the time. And this is a report uh, by a reporter who's following along with this Senate investigation. And this also talks about how the Bullhead Camp was what he called Cunningham uh, Camp B, but which we can probably understand to be uh, Cunningham uh, Camp 2. Um, I think with our research, we're fairly confident that the Sugarland 95 site was not the historical bullhead camp that is referred to in the records, that that actually was a camp on the Cunningham plantation land uh, just to the east. That, of course, raises the question of where that bullhead camp really was. And that is a very tough question to pin down. I don't think that we have a great answer for that. No map, no report that we've seen shows the precise location of the camps. We only really have one good clue so far down here at the bottom of the screen. An 1893 state Senate investigation of the camps describes Cunningham too as being one and a half miles below the refinery immediately on the bank of Oyster Creek. Now this is a uh, map here of uh, modern sugar land. We had Gabe, one of our researchers, kind of do a little Google Maps wizardry and kind of measure out an, uh, uh, one and a half miles below the historical location of the sugar refinery. And that would put this camp somewhere in uh, the area that you see here in that kind of large uh, blue circle. If you're familiar with this area uh, now, it is uh, quite developed. And you can kind of see the other circle shows the Sugarland 95 location. Uh, it's on what was historically a different plantation, and it certainly is not on uh, Oyster Creek. We think that a more accurate name uh, for the site might simply be the Ellis Camp Cemetery. That name comes from the fact that the labor forces near the Sugarland 95 site were always described in the records as Ellis forces. And the name used to describe the Sugarland 95 area for most of its time as a convict's lease camp was Ellis Camp uh, number one. Now, I raise this issue because it's not a trivial matter. And I'm not just trying to quibble with the Fort Bend ISD report, which is an invaluable and impressive uh, document. It is important to be accurate, but more crucially, we believe that the name Bullhead conceals a big part of the story that needs to be told. These camps, as I'm sure those of you who know the history of convicts lease are aware, these camps were places of horrific abuse and pain, but also places of immense profit for men like Ellis. The name Ellis Camp tells the full story of convict lease, both the horror and the profit of them. Think about visitors to the site or students learning about the Sugarland 95 in their classrooms in the area. The name Bullhead Camp can tell the history of a tragedy, but it leads into this sort of historical thinking where we oftentimes think about the injustices of the past as simply being uh, the way things were. Right, Bullhead Camp was this place where some real bad things uh, happened. The name Ellis Camp does something different. It reminds us that these injustices were the product of choices that were made by men. 
And it highlights the role that convicts lease and the exploitation of laborers played in building Sugarland, both in a physical and financial sense. Um, we can talk a lot more in the Q&A about kind of our the position on why we think Ellis Camp is a better name and the sort of historical and I think also moral implications of the, the naming question. Um, but I want to move on to Serena. Um, we're probably never going to discover the actual Bullhead Camp Cemetery or Cunningham number two or most of these cemeteries, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to tell the stories of the men who labored and died there. Towards that end, uh, Serena has built a database of all of the people who died on the Ellis and Cunningham plantations in the convict lease era. And I want to kind of turn it to over uh, to her so that she can show how we may identify more names at the Sugarland 95 site and also kind of point to some uh, new and fruitful avenues of inquiry. Good morning and thanks and thank you everybody. Uh, I want to thank you in particular to CJC for having me today and giving me the opportunity of talking about my research. Uh, I hope that this will start a collaborative research on the Sugarline 95 report. In particular, I would like to engage uh, uh, who did uh, uh, for uh, the Sugarland 95 report a work a similar overlap in some way with mine, Sandra Rogers, uh, the retired curator of uh, the Prison Museum. Uh, I want to tell um, a little bit of me before I start. I just want to uh, um, hopefully answer your curiosity about my accent. I'm Italian. I came to the US in 2006. I was, I used to be an MD. Um, I was a cardiologist. I worked as such for um, about 20 years. And when I came to Texas, I fell in love with the Texas, its people and American history. And then here I am. So I started a couple of years ago taking interest in comic labor, uh, in particular when I was uh, studying and doing my master at Sam Houston State University, where I met Zach. And I'm now working on a dissertation proposal uh, on uh, that looks at the development of Houston capitalism in 19th century through the lens of comic leasing to railroad companies. Uh, that historical inquiry um, got me in touch with the uh, TCJC project uh, and last spring I started working um, to build up this database of convicts. Uh, so uh, what I want to do now is briefly sketch for you my research methodology, uh, because when you build uh, a database, uh, uh, method, uh, methods uh, matter. Uh, and so, uh, first of all, I think you are now starting seeing my, um, my screen. Uh, I uh, relied on prison records, uh, register and record ledgers. They are different because they address different set of data. And so they allow me to get different information. Those are divided by prison, Huntsville and Rusk. Uh, Huntsville uh, are the one I focus on because they are the one from which uh, um, Ellis uh, convicts came from. Um, those uh, uh, ledgers and, re uh, and register are organized by convict registration number. Uh, they are in chronological order. That means that if you wanted to uh, get all the numbers there, all the figure about uh, uh, how many uh, uh, convicts work for Ellis, you have to start from the, the start of the prison uh, convict leasing system and the, for, from the first uh, convict that, that it's in the record. Uh, because uh, a convict that was uh, in prison in the uh, 1960s, uh, in the 1960s before everything started on this, uh, uh, on, uh, on plantation, and Ellis Plantation could be still have been employed on the Ellis Plantation in the 80s or so. Uh, this means that you uh, have to go through something like 22,000 names and about 7,500 pages. And this is not to tell that I did an amazing job or anybody did an amazing job, but to explain why it is possible that you make mistakes in the meanwhile, right? You forgot some. Uh, of those convicts, uh, and uh, this is not done on purpose. It's done uh, by the mass uh, how massive this work is. Um, so uh, I want to show you what uh, a, a page from the convict condos register looks like. 
If we focus, uh, for example, on Andrew Jackson, you can uh, get his name, uh, the, the term of conviction, uh, the location of uh, the court where he was judged, uh, the, his number, convict number, of course, and a little bit of his stories, the uh, stories of punishment for indolence with lashes. He's moving from uh, having been located first on Ellis number three and then moved to Ellis number one and finally dying in March 29, 87. Uh, and then you plug you plug this name into another ledger, so, which is the comic record ledger so that looks like this, where you can focus on Andrew Jackson down here and discover that Andrew Jackson was 24 the day he was convicted and uh, he was weighing 145 pounds. He was uh, five feet high at all and uh, he was a black man. Uh, from Texas, native of Texas, who was convicted for horse theft. And he got a conviction for that crime of 15 years. And then you get some modern, more information about his scars, how he looked, and if he had special marks. And that was uh, done because it was useful to identify him in case he was escaping. Thing that actually happened because he escaped and then he was recaptured in 83. Um, and so you get out of that with the uh, a monstrous a spreadsheet that looks like this uh, and it's about 120 columns uh, in which you try to plot every detail because you don't want to go over those 22,000 names again. You want to do it uh, everything that is possible to answer any possible historical inquiries uh, and have it all set and this is what I did. So it's a long story. It's a story that starts with Andrew Jackson in prison in 1875 and finished with another Andrew, Andrew Blackwell, who died in 1906. And it's also a complex story and an idea of that we already got from uh, uh, Zach's presentation. Uh, it's a story that involves Ellis camps mainly, but uh, we cannot forget that might involve also Canyon camps, uh, Imperial Sugar Company and Imperial State Farm, because all of those were located and leasing convicts uh, on, uh, on the sugar land. So let's look at Ellis Plantation. So uh, what you can find up here is uh, how the cans are being recorded in the ledgers and records, Ellis, Ellis 1, Ellis 2, Ellis 3, creating some confusion at times, like Ellis 1 plus 2, and then a change in name when uh, the property went to uh, uh, Ellis's son. Um, I, uh, for your understanding, I put in this uh, chart, uh, the number of convicts on any of this uh, uh, camp, uh, the time where uh, those deaths occurred, and then I make a, a brief calculation about uh, trying to set uh, uh, how many of those uh, uh, convicts died for diseases and how many that, uh, died for um, injuries uh, that they uh, had on uh, during um, performing their labor or uh, causes that are anyway related to labor, like a weather condition that provoke a sunstroke. Many of them actually died of sunstroke working in extreme condition, other were even striking by lightning uh, and some drowned. Uh, for the killed, uh, you have to think that mm, the majority of those were people who were killed in an attempt to escape, but some of those were killed by accident or they were killed because uh, uh, they were tortured. And uh, at the end, uh, I got uh, 142 uh, names uh, spanning from 1879 to 1907, one third of them uh, died for causes strictly related to the conviction. Though we have to think that the diseases that are up, uh, up here are certainly connected to the fact that they were convicts in there because the, the kind of assistance they received was small and the, and the medical assistant and also because the plantation were located in an area that was more prone to diseases like malaria and fever. Um, here I compared my result with the result that are reported in uh, the Sugar Lamb final report. Um, you see that there is a discrepancy in, uh, in green here. You can see the difference in numbers. And you have two lines. I suggest you to follow my, my upper row here. Uh, and you see that the difference uh, that we have in names is 76. It looks uh, uh, really an impressive difference. But if you dig uh, more deeply into the reason for that difference, uh, you will discover that uh, there is an argument in the Sugarland uh, report that has been done about uh, 
early scams. In particular, it has been argued that uh, the name of the campaign changed in relation to Bullhead, and the effort has been done was to identify who were actually employed in on the Bullhead camp. And so sometimes uh, uh, Alice 2 was working on Bullhead camp, sometimes Alice 1 was uh, named uh, uh, for uh, Bullhead camp. So apparently there is a shift in names that is related to the fact, and this is the argument that is in the report, that Ellis changed property ownership over time. And when he acquired or sold some piece of his property, then the name of the camping, the camps changed. Uh, if we buy that uh, argument, then I, uh, you can restructure my, my figures and their figures and see that the difference comes down to 11 names that, that have been missed for you know, the massive uh, kind of research that has been done. So this uh, numbers, uh, 11 people certainly had to be um, uh, added to the report. Uh, but I have also a critique of the Ellis Camps framework that has it is presented in the Sugarland report. First of all, the change of names of the camps was not so clear cut as it seems in the report. Uh, the records, uh, if you look at the record, the prison records, they indicate fluidity in the location of the labor force. In particular, if you look at uh, the reports that uh, Zachary Mons showed before, the superintendent report, and the number of uh, the, uh, what was written in 8084, 8086, uh, when the change of camp names uh, are claimed having took place, you see that the word camp and labor force and force are used very loosely and interchangeably. So, it appears, and especially if you compare the way it has been used for Ellis Plantation has been used for railroad, it's exactly the same way. And for the railroad, we cannot believe that that meant a camp as a physical address because it was based on mobility. And so as well, if we look at the, um, at the plantation, Ellis Plantation, the, the name camp didn't necessarily mean a physical location, a physical address. I'm trying to explain uh, you what I, how I see it. I'm also a civil war historian. So I, I see that as uh, this convict force, as uh, a sort of uh, a regiment uh, in a, a, or a company. And uh, as a company has a surgeon and, uh, and someone controlling the soldiers, as well, uh, th that happened that way. So uh, when we talk about Ellis too, that meant that there was someone in charge of that labor force. And the labor force, the soldiers, were the one moving where it was needed. And that happened on the railroads as much as, uh, as, much as happened on the plantation. That was not a cotton plantation. That was a sugar plantation. Not only that means a lot in terms of the harshness of the working condition, but that means also a changing kind of labor according to harvest that, that can, could go from planting seeds up to harvesting, but also doing sugar and making sugar. And so when the Ellis uh, uh, and Cunningham bought together, they uh, construct and built together the, the, the mill to produce sugar, they for certainly collaborated with their labor force to get that out. So the change of name of camps as has been portrayed in the Sugarland 95 report is certainly possible, but I didn't really find evidence as a, for the access I had with this COVID-19 time. Uh, so further evidence of that has to be provided. And in the report, actually, the source used that the same I used. So I have suggestion now where the, all this conversation has to go, in my opinion, so just one expanding. So we use, uh, we need to use the complete list of convicts who died at Ellis camp when proceeding with genetic and genealogical studies. That list might be even expanded to include the convicts that work on Cunningham camps in case we don't find a match. For example, I did it, uh, my work on Cunningham. You see, we have 145 that convicts uh, there as well in a timeline that matched the one of Hellis uh, and with uh, similar uh, consequences. So, just so number two, matching. We need to attempt to match the names uh, to the archaeological findings. And this is not just for discovering the name of uh, 
those remains. What we need to do is do it with the purpose of identifying the camp where the graveyard is located. If there was actually a name for the camp, perfect. If there was not, we have to keep our mind open. Uh, naming the, the, the remains is certainly important, but first we need to have uh, the narrative straight on the camp's name. Suggestion number three, reconstructing. We have to continue to reconstruct the life of the convicts before their conviction to advance our understanding of reconstruction and Jim Crow and how the 13th Amendment was used to create the convict list system to enforce and enforce racial hierarchy. Uh, how do we do that? We go through census. We discover names. We discovered this young kid of eight years old that some years later became a convict and died on a plantation. And we can do something like uh, looking into newspaper articles. Uh, for example, here we have a story, Richard Reed was a black man of 22 years of age, convicted of burglary and theft in 1886. Uh, his life as a convict lasted only three months. He died at least two of a sunstroke. He had declared them, uh, himself not guilty. And you have proof of this, uh, um, sorry, I went back. You have a proof of it on, uh, on the newspaper, where it says that he challenged the, the lower court verdict with an appeal. If we can retrieve those records, we will get his voice, his, his reasons, his story. Suggestion number four, rewarding the narrative. And this is the last one. The idea that the report is final creates a sense of closure and community healing. But that sense of closure and community healing is definitely premature. It's illusionary and unattainable so far. It's romantic. Yes, it's romantic talking about bodies finally put at rest. And we historians love that kind of a romantic conclusion. But that romanticism needs to be unpacked. For whom those bodies are at rest so far? The dead convicts themselves, they were at rest already. We disturb them, them. For Ben ISD, maybe they can go ahead with their construction. The community, probably because we can put it in the past and forgot it happened and not look at how that affected our present. There's descendants of that. In our cautions, this is an open question. Wording like final and arrest promotes the idea of a distant past with no connection to our present, obscuring the historical continuity of racial injustice. This is why this conversation has to remain open. This is why we have to talk about it and not consider that final. With that, I'm done. <laughs> Well, I guess we'll turn this back over to our uh, moderators for questions. Okay, um, we're still kind of waiting for questions, but I do have one that you mentioned that I could, I could ask you, um, Dr. Montz. Uh, you talked about the historical implications of Ellis being a better name. I was wondering if you could go a little bit deeper into that to provide us with some context about what you're referring to. Uh, sure. I mean, there I'm really thinking about the way that the uh, the public kind of uh, learns about and thinks about uh, what we have there uh, at the Sugarland 95 site. Um, you guys saw in the picture, if any of you guys have been out there, uh, the site is in the literal middle of a parking lot. Uh, they built the parking lot all the way around the back side of it, uh, too. It has very little uh, signage. Um, I don't know, that's perhaps being in a suburban parking lot in Fort Bend County is a particularly uh, Texan uh, way to spend eternity, but uh, it's really not doing uh, justice to the people who were buried there. And it's also not doing justice to people in uh, the present who are seeking to understand uh, what this meant. Um, I am, you know, a historical researcher, but mostly I'm a teacher. And everything that I uh, kind of think about now in history, I think about from the perspective of how is it taught. And when I think about this, all I think about is the worksheets that people in seventh grade uh, Texas history are getting. 
or uh, you know, in high school doing American history classes there uh, in the Fort Bend region. And I think about kind of the worksheet that says Bullhead Camp. And that worksheet is about the names and the people who died there and that sort of stuff. And it becomes a, man, the, the past was a in, unjust place, right? And that common thing that people oftentimes say, that's it's just the way things were back then, right? Um, and then I think about the worksheet that says uh, Ellis Camp, right? And one of the questions on there is who is Ellis? right? What was this guy all about? And you start poking around into that question and you learn that Ellis is a guy that sets this up, that's instrumental in designing this system, but that at the time that most people were working on his lands and were dying uh, due to abuse and torture uh, on these lands, uh, Ellis was in Austin stacking cash, right? He becomes a very uh, rich man. And he, of course, knows about everything that's going there. Ellis knows about the whip. He knows about the torture. He knows about the poor conditions. But to him, that injustice is profit. Um, and that's a side of the story that you lose entirely, I think, if you call it bullhead camp. Or I'll say at least that it's easy to avoid if you call it bullhead camp. There are a lot of things in Sugarland named after Ellis or Cunningham, and they are important founders of the city. And Sugarland is therefore a a great place to think about the complexities of the past, and in particular, our Southern, our Texan past. Um, so the, the, the point of this is, is not necessarily to, uh, to kind of, you know, uh, put Ellis on trial or to make people feel guilty about where this place comes from. Very few people who live in modern Sugarland really have that much of a connection or, or, uh, to what was going on uh, at this time. But I like to think that kind of uh, telling this history, starting with the name of uh, Ellis Camp is, and I kind of hinted at this before, a reminder that kind of the injustices of the past are built, right? And we can name them and study them. And that's kind of the entire point of the CLLP. And it's one of the things that uh, Mr. Moore was certainly interested in. And if you study how these things were built in the past, it gets people thinking about how we might build a more just present or future. Right. Um, and that's something that I think gets gets missed in a name like Bullhead Camp, which is in named after being a geographical feature is something that people might casually see um, and, and might not kind of follow to kind of its uh, historical conclusion there. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the next question is directed at the two, uh, both of you, so either one of you could answer, but it says, would you say FBISD is halting some progress? I graduated from there and heard about the Sugarland 95 in college. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say something on that and here kind of other uh, members of CLLP who have been involved in kind of working with Fort Bend and at times kind of in disagreement with Fort Bend about what to do with this site uh, can probably provide uh, kind of fuller answers on this. But I'll just, so I'll just provide this from uh, my perspective and this is not necessarily the perspective of CLLP. Um, when you read that report, uh, the only conclusion that you can come to is that at some point Fort Bend ISD and the people who worked on that report were very serious about trying to figure out who these people were, right? Uh, that report uh, really is, it really, it just really is something. I encourage everybody to kind of download it and, uh, you know, reserve about a month of your time to kind of look through it. Uh, uh, parts of it just really are, are quite spectacular. Um, but I would say you saw that picture that I put up earlier that I think that that site is there as, uh, well, it's something that was quite literally built around, right? And I think that uh, instead, uh, the community, certainly CLLP, would like to see that as a site which allows us to build forward, right? As a place where uh, people can go. It's probably going to be, to be honest, it probably will be the only sort of kind of physical location that can be directly tied to this story. We might even find out where other camps have been, but they're going to be under development. You know, that's probably my suspicion with this Cunningham uh, 2 camp. Uh, depending on where the other ones are, kind of, we can kind of guess where some of the locations are, and some of them are still kind of undeveloped, but in all likelihood, this is going to be the place uh, where this story uh, can be told. And I, I, I do think that uh, 
probably a bit more public pressure and public interest is required in order to convince parties in uh, Fort Bend to do something more with this, right? To stay on it. And that's one of the things I think that CLLP is trying to do in its, in its own way in kind of publicizing data, in trying to provide extra names and raising this question of the, the name of the camp. So yeah. I hope that kind of... Uh, yes, and I would add uh, that only the fact that the report, uh, so complete that it's 500 pages, came out uh, in that form uh, and with uh, that clarity uh, and that uh, for Ben published it uh, as soon as it got, uh, it got it. I think it's a really good sign of their willingness not to obscure the story. Now it's part of the community effort uh, to uh, find a way to work with uh, for band uh, for building a narrative and a memorialization of the, the site, as uh, Zach was saying. But I would not be judgmental of for band for uh, considering it closed because those are not their words; are the words of their report. Okay. Yes. Thank you both for answering that question. Um, another conversation someone this is a another um audience member asked another conversation going on right now concerns what to do about the jaybird monument currently standing on the lawn of fort ben isd the fort ben county courthouse what role did or did if you guys know um either one of you did the jaybirds play in the development of the local convict leasing system and how much of it predated their control of the county government beginning in 1889 it's a pretty deep question but wanted to ask seemed like a good one uh brian i'll i'll uh i'll kind of answer that question as much as i know um i i, I don't know that much about the current controversy about the the jaybird monument on the uh, at the fort bend county courthouse although kind of for those who uh, know the history of the jaybird woodpecker uh, war which was the kind of battle for political control of fort bend that involved a, a group dedicated to the politics of white supremacy uh fighting uh violently of course uh with a group that was based in a sort of biracial coalition over the issue of black rights um it's absurd to have a monument to a group that was premised on the idea of unequal rights standing on the steps of a courthouse, which is meant to be a, a temple to civic justice and the idea of equality under the law. Um, but the kind of bigger uh, question there about what role uh, those uh, political groups, the Jaybirds may have had in the development of convict lease. The convict lease system certainly predates uh, the Jaybirds there. I think that there is a really interesting research question of their grad students out there, a, a good dissertation uh, topic uh, for uh, to examine the, the relationship between these two groups, right? Uh, certainly we can imagine kind of who would have been in support of convict lease and perhaps we can think about how the profits of systems like convict lease enabled the politics of groups like uh, the Jaybirds. But I, I, I think it's kind of fascinating to recreate that historical space in the late 1800s when you have uh, groups of kind of uh, black politicians and black voters who are involved in a, a contest, a literal war in some cases, over their rights and over their place in a society. And they're doing so in a place where they can walk right past kind of where they're, where they're, where they're seeing the consequences of losing rights in a society, right? Like these are, the, the questions are so, clear and the issues are so starkly drawn it, to kind of recreate this place in which you're fighting for your right uh, to vote and to be a member of a society and we see what happens if you lose because you're walking past a place where kind of slavery is being reimposed um i think that would be really a fascinating story to connect those two areas of texas history that we know something about but i don't know much about the connections thank you dr mont um, the next question is about community involvement. Um, what can the community do to help calls uh, to help calls for work progress? Y'all are doing great stuff, and I'm sure that if more people knew about this, they'd be willing to help. Serena, you want to? I'll, I'll dive in. Um, yeah. You go ahead. Well, okay. Um, well, first, you know, keep in touch with TCJC, right? 
um, with the, the web page in particular is filled not just with this sort of uh, historical uh, research uh, and the Convict Leasing Labor Project, but the TCJC uh, as an organization, the Criminal Justice Coalition kind of always kind of uh, puts up updates on kind of actions and, and lobbying on broader criminal justice issues, but also kind of updates on this issue of what to do with the story of the Sugar Land 95. Um, the, the kind of other part of it that is, I think that it's a pretty open uh, process and kind of calls right now for some creativity about what to do with this story. There's one kind of ideal future that I think a lot of us have in mind, which would involve this site containing you know, obviously lots of explanation, but uh, maybe even uh, a museum or something done in, in conjunction with Fort Bend ISD or with the U of H uh, uh, campus that's down there, which uh, very well might sit on the site of, a, of a, another camp, by the way. Um, and uh, so that's one vision. But the other place that this goes is out into the public for people involved in uh, education Right to start integrating these stories into the the you know the way that they uh, the way that they teach, um, so I think there's a, a kind of a lot of avenues that that could take, and I, I think other people and kind of can express through the website the kind of TCJC uh, folks kind of where we might take this. Yeah, and uh, I want to add that, that many of uh, the resources uh, that we are used uh, are now digitized and they are online. So if uh, someone wants to dig into the convict records and look at those and uh, get a sense and uh, you know, uh, try to play investigator, they can do that. It's easy uh, to access those data. Those data and it's, uh, uh, we need labor force. We really need uh, that kind of uh, people willing to uh, write database, uh, to look into uh, local archives, uh, to retrieve uh, the stories. Uh, and that is uh, a really nice uh, way for educators as well to involve their students. Uh, I often, I have to, I had to high school students, uh, now they are graduated. And uh, I would have loved their teacher to involve them in a project like that, instead of spending a lot of time on cracking tests. And uh, that would have given them a story of, uh, how, uh, an understanding of uh, historical methods but also an understanding of how they can be uh, become better uh, empowered in their society and their community in a, providing a service that is historical in perspective, but also speaking to the present. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to you both for sharing time with us, talking about this really important issue. We're so grateful. Jazz and I both are really grateful to be able to um, navigate this conversation with you. Um, and, and that wraps up um, this discussion. Thank you everyone for joining and we look forward to having another one of these very soon. Thank you. Thank you everybody.